two of that. And I hope you enjoyed the first installment. If you missed it, you're going to want to go back because, and watch that because really last week I kind of laid a foundation for you for the goal of all conflict resolution by the Bible and what, what the Word of God says about conflict resolution, what should be our goal in it. And I'm going to take it from uh, last week and kind of expound on it a little bit more. And as we go each week, we'll get a little bit more into the practical side of how do we do this? How do we walk this out? And so I'm excited to bring you that message this morning, but before I do, just a couple things I want to remind you of. We had an amazing week here at Hope Church. You heard uh, Pastor Justin tell you a little bit about it as we were in each of the major high schools in this valley, and we got to be at Evergreen Junior High too. I can tell you that I was personally there and got to personally speak to some of them, and if you only could see some of the things that were written on those bricks, your heart would absolutely break for some of the youth in this valley. And I know that sometimes we can look at, you know, why, why are we doing that? And how come we're spending so much money in that? And by the way, we could still use your help to fund it. We are not fully funded in it. And we just trusted that God is going to use this. So if God would put it on your heart to give um, to Hope Church so that we can, we can do things like that. We believe that God has called us to make an impact in this valley. But if you could have seen some of the things that were written on those bricks that were broken, uh, it, would, it would have literally broke your heart as it did mine. And so um, I believe that we stirred something up in the, in the lives of young people to think bigger for their life and to try to take steps to overcome the obstacles in their life and culminated with the rally here Friday night. Thursday night, I was up in Eureka for our last Eureka interest meeting, which is getting really, really exciting as we're almost just a little over 30 days away from our Hope Eureka church launch and uh, the community there is, is getting very excited about what God is going to do in and through Hope Church. In fact, um, today, after service at 1215, we have our Hope Church Eureka Interest Meeting. So in other words, if you are from Kalispell and you're interested in finding out more how you could help with the Hope Eureka launch, we want you to stay. We're going to have that meeting right in the fireside room, which is this room out through the double doors and to the right, for those of you who don't know. At about 12.15, we're going to shoot for it to start. So come out to that. We would love for you to get involved. Uh, a couple more things. Maybe you're new here to Hope Church and you're hearing about all this amazing things that God is doing, and you want to know, how, how can I get involved? How do, how do I become a member, we don't really have membership here at Hope Church, but we have something called partnership. And we believe that partnership is a biblical principle that Paul lays out in his words to Timothy, that as he partnered with those that were within the churches to see the gospel move forward. And so you might be wondering, how do I get involved or how do I find out more about Hope Church? Um, we have something we call growth tracks, and we do them now, this year, we're experimenting with a little bit different plan. We used to do them every month. This year, we're only doing them every other month, and we're condensing them into two Sundays. So next Sunday after service, we're going to provide child care for you. We're going to provide lunch for you. And if you're new here to Hope Church and you want to find out more about how you can belong to this church and get involved, I want to encourage you, immediately after service, go back to the Connect Center there and sign up for our growth tracks. I get to teach next week some, a class that we belong which really helps you understand um, a little bit more about the mission and vision that God has given this church and if you belong here in this place. And so I want to encourage you to come out for that. Last thing, how many ladies do we have in the house this morning? Can, oh, my goodness, that was so weak. Wow. I know if I did the fellas that they would be way, way louder than that. Come on, how many ladies do I have in the house this morning? Ladies, we've got an amazing event that we put on once a year and once a year only coming up. It's called IF Conference. And I can tell you that I hear, I get to hear some of the amazing testimonies that come out of that conference every single year. And it is amazing. So if you are a lady, you are not going to want to leave without signing up. I believe that the, the women's ministry here at Hope Church is going to be out in the foyer and have a table up there. Do not go through those double doors without signing up for that conference. Otherwise, you are just going to miss out on something big that I believe God is going to do at that conference and what he wants to do in your life. So sign up for that. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Are you guys ready for the word this morning? Yeah. Well, I'm excited to bring it to you. So if you will, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. As we are um, diving back into this conflict resolution 
by the book. Romans 12. I love um, this passage, Romans 12, verse 9 through 18, we're going to take a look at. And I love the, the subtitle over this passage of Scripture. It's called Love in Action. Love in Action. Last week I brought you the first installment of that message series. You, you remember it? Because I know you remember everything that I say, right? It was called Love Wins. Love Wins. The goal of every conflict in our life is that we would allow the Spirit of God to grow us in love and that love would ultimately win out. And so today we're going to start walking out some of the details of how we let that happen as it pertains to the conflicts that come up in our life. Because right now, I'm guessing every single one of you here from little conflicts to very big ones, and some of you are in the middle of some really, really tough stuff in your life right now that you're going through that you're really not sure how to handle. And it's got you anxious, stressed out, and fearful. And so whether it's work, whether it's um, challenges at home, in your married life, friends, at school, uh, in your career path, whatever it might be for you, maybe it's in your finances, I can tell you that there's conflicts that are happening in your life and in my life right now, and yet God wants to grow us up as we go through them and not, as we grow through them rather, not just go through them. So we're going to take a look at this passage of scripture and we're going to let the great apostle Paul speak to us a little bit about how we can begin to put this love that we have, this love that we have experienced through Christ in action in our life. It says this, love must be sincere. Some of the manuscripts say, um, don't be hypocritical in your love. We can't have uh, hypocritical love. I think that's an interesting way that he starts off this passage, really hitting us right square in the mouth to begin with. That sometimes our love cannot be sincere, cannot be genuine, that we can put on a front, that we're, we're here, we love each other. Especially, I think this is really common in the church, is that there can be an appearance of love, but our love isn't really genuine yet, and it can be a little bit hypocritical. So Paul is challenging you right off the bat. Love must be. It's not an option. It must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. I think it's interesting because in the beginning, He's really focusing on those of us who would call ourselves followers of Jesus as it pertains to how we relate to one another in the church. And now he's making a little bit of a transition into people, all people, people whether they're believers or not. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, and you want to highlight this verse, we're going to dive into this next one a little bit deeper. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So, Father, we give you the time that we have together this morning, and we just invite you to come. Holy Spirit, I pray right now for every single person. God, I know that this is not just another church service, that this is an a ordained appointment that you have for every single person here. God, that you want to challenge us that you want to wake us up, that you want to teach us, and that you want to lead us into more and more of your love so that we can show more of your love to other people and that we can overcome the conflicts in our life and see them resolved so that we can have peace and that we can become peacemakers. Father, I pray that you would touch every single person we wouldn't leave here the same that we came in. God, that, that we would be changed. That cannot happen without your Holy Spirit. So we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come right now to every heart, to every mind. God, I pray that you would anoint me, 
that you would speak through me, that I would be a vessel that you would use this morning for your word to go deep within our spirits and to be planted, to take root, and so that it would bear fruit in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Well, we want to, uh, the title of my message this morning is Make Peace, Not War. Make peace, not war. So turn to your neighbor and say, make peace, not war. Give him the big peace sign. Make peace, not war. We want to make peace, not war. You've heard it said, uh, those who live by the sword get shot by those who don't use them. Those who, those who die by the sword get shot by those who don't use them. I thought that was pretty funny. Make peace, not war. So we want to, um, we're going to dive in here and unpack this a little bit. Last week, I really gave you the foundation for all conflict resolution, and that is this. Every conflict is an opportunity to fight for peace, glorify God, honor people, and to grow stronger in love, to resolve that love wins. Can we say this together one more time? Every conflict is an opportunity to fight for peace, glorify God, honor people, and to grow stronger in love to resolve that love wins. That's good. I don't care who you are. So good. This week, I'm going to unpack that a little bit. We're going to go through each of those points a little bit more. But I kind of have a, a big idea for you, as I try to do with each message, and that's this. Your spiritual maturity depends on your willingness to face, forgive, and forget past offenses. I'm going to say that one more time. Your spiritual maturity depends on your willingness to face, forgive, and to forget past offenses. You see, because I believe the more I study Scripture, the more I come to realize that unless we face our fear of resolving conflict, and unless we're willing to forgive the people that have offended us, that have hurt us, um, in some cases that have abused us, um, and move on, in other words, forget those past offenses, which can be very challenging depending on the level of deep hurt and pain that we've experienced. But until we get to the place where we're able to do that, I, I think that our spiritual maturity is dependent upon it. In other words, what can be stunting your spiritual growth and maturity right now isn't that you come to church every week, isn't necessarily that you read your Bible every day. Those are all good things that will help you grow in your relationship and with the Lord and will help you mature in him. But, but this is a big deal to God, so much that he said, if your brother has offended you and you come to worship, just like you're coming here this morning and you gathered to worship, and some of you, maybe you got into a fight with your wife on the car. <laughs> I never had that problem, but maybe you do. Um, I mean, with five kids and all, we just... We didn't, you know, we sung the Partridge family on the way here to church, and it was always just beautiful. Got here with plenty of time, never any stress, you know, or anything like that. So I don't know about you guys. Maybe you got into a fight on the way to church or got into some kind of disagreement this morning. But the Bible's really clear and emphatic that even when we have a conflict, that before we come to worship God and we come to bring our gift of worship or our offering to God to drop it, drop it, drop it like it's hot, and turn away, because it is, and go make it right with your brother or sister. It's that big of a deal to God. And see, he knows that, and I believe that for many of us in this room, that part of our lack of spiritual maturity and growth is the fact that we have all these years, some of us more than others, but we have Literally years of buildup, of tension, of stress, of anxiety because of unresolved conflict in our life that is affecting you below the surface of your soul way more than you know or realize. And so we've got to get this thing right. We've got to, we've got to resolve that we're going to bring resolution to some of these conflicts. With this. So last week, as we closed, I asked you to begin to pray and ask God, to put on your heart those people or those instances that maybe you have some conflict with that isn't resolved. But here's the biggest problem with conflict resolution, is that you and I, I believe, have never been taught a healthy way to deal with it. We've never been taught the biblical way of dealing with it, which is meant to bring health 
and wholeness and peace into our lives. And because of it, we've watched our parents who didn't know how to deal with it, and so they dealt with it in unhealthy ways, and we've watched them, or we've watched our grandparents, or we've watched our aunt and uncles, or we've watched friends, and we personally haven't dealt with it healthy, and until we can get some health into the way we resolve conflict, we're gonna continue this cycle, and somebody needs to break it. I remember a long time ago when I got into men's ministry and, and I was faced with some of the realities that men are faced with in their life and the, and the strongholds and the things that we as men are up against. The Lord spoke to me and said, Lance, unless a man is willing to get in front of the battle and get out in front of the battle lines and is determined to get victory in some of these areas, there's never going to be a cycle that is broken in the life of generationally speaking so that the generation behind you can walk it out and see it walked out in freedom and in victory. Somebody needs to break the cycle. And so the, the question is, are we going to be the people? Are we going to be the generation that breaks the cycle of unhealthy conflict that models for the next generation. This is how we do this in a healthy way. This is how, what the Bible says about how we resolve these. So first I want to start out with some unhealthy ways that we resolve conflict. And there are two main ways that we resolve conflict in unhealthy ways. First one is fight or flight. The second one is flight. First one's fight. Second one's flight. They get confusing if you say them really fast. But we either fight or we flight. In other words, we either attack or we run because we don't know how to deal with it in an unhealthy way. And let's be honest, it's uncomfortable, right? I mean, who likes facing conflict? Nobody does. I haven't met one person unless you're some weird sadomasochist. Like, you, you love doing that. Um, but when we understand the goals of it that God has in the Bible for it, we understand that actually... Facing conflict and facing people that we have conflict with, they can, if we do it in a healthy way, it can actually bring peace and joy and happiness. And it can draw you closer to that person if we do it in the right way. So let me unpack these two just, just a little bit for you. When we, when we run from conflict, how many runners, don't raise your hand, how many runners do we have here this morning that when something goes wrong, you run from it. Like you just want to brush it over the rug, you, you, under the rug rather. You want to say, it's okay, um, I'll get over it. Listen, time, one of the greatest lies that we can believe is that time heals all wounds. Let me tell you something. Time does not heal all wounds. I've heard it said like this. Just because you go to the doctor, the longer you sit in the hospital doesn't mean that you're going to get better. It just means you're going to stay sick longer. And, the, and this is how a lot of us approach conflict in our life. We think that if we just let time go by, because time will alleviate the initial tension and anxiety felt from conflict, and if we're not careful, there's a window of time that we need to deal with it, and if we don't, we, we start to get the ease of our emotions, and then we can start to justify that we don't really need to address this conflict in our life. So... I can just pretend like it didn't happen or I can just move on from it. But the reality is, is you're not moving on. You're not really moving on. You might be going forward in your life, but that thing is still under the surface and still manipulating your emotions. And it is doing something inside of you that is now affecting the way that you filter conversations with people because you've been offended. And now what happens when, when we're offended, um, we, we get defensive, we get touchy in those areas, and that it is affecting other areas that if you're not careful, it will take the unhealthy conflict and it will bring tension into healthy relationships in your life. And, it, and over, over time, it will sabotage even healthy relationships if you don't deal with it in the right way. So we can't run from it. See, when we run from it, our focus is on us. Because we just don't want to deal with it if we're going to be real with ourselves. We don't, we don't like the tension. We don't like the anxiety and the stress. So we just try to avoid it. We try to run from it. And when we do that, the attention is on us. Um, in, in his book, Peacemakers, 
Ken City says this. He says it's like peace faking. Peace faking. It's like you and I, we're good, but the reality is we're not really good. I'm faking it just for the sense. And you know what? I hate to say this, but this is one of the most prominent ways that we deal with it in the church. Oh, I'm just going to love you, brother, and, and, and we're just going to move on and get past it. And the reality is you're not getting past anything. You're just faking that there's peace when the reality is, is there isn't really peace. The other side of that coin is that we can fight. We can, we can go on the attack mode because we've been hurt, we've been wounded, we feel like we've been wronged, and we can get defensive, and we can attack the other person, and really, just like in MMA, a good MMA fight, we can submit them into where they tap out and cry uncle, even if we're right or wrong. And some of us, we have to be careful because I think when we get into attack mode, if you're more prone to attack than to run, uh, oftentimes it's because you want to control somebody else. And you want to control the situation. So you're going to attack that person and you're going to be the first one to get at them so that you can make sure that they know that you're right and they're wrong. And tell them all the reasons why they were wrong and, and you can get on attack mode. Now, that one he calls peace breaking. Because when we get in either of, these, either of these modes, he says that you begin this process of K-Y-R-G, kiss your relationship goodbye. <laughs> like you can literally get into a place where if you attack people in conflict or you run and hide it and fake that everything's okay, that slowly but surely you can kiss your relationship with goodbye with that person because you are not addressing the situation in a healthy way. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to fight for peace. Jesus said this, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Why, why does he say they shall be called the sons of God? Why? Because God himself made peace with humanity. My Bible says that we were enemies with God because of sin in our life. That, that, that we were sinners and we were so far from him and he sent his son Jesus to make peace with humanity between God and us. It once and for all paid the price for our sin, made the sacrifice on the cross. Aren't you grateful this morning for Jesus? Aren't you grateful that we serve a God that is not content with tension and this great chasm that sin caused between humanity and Father God? that he loves you and me just that much, that he was willing to fight for peace. And to, trust me, he had to fight his own flesh to get to the cross. He didn't want to go there, but he did it. He made that sacrifice for you and for me. And if we're going to see God do what he wants to do through the conflicts in our life, because I guarantee you this, right now, the conflict that you're in, God is trying to do something in your life through it. He's trying to teach you something, He's trying to grow you in an area. And, and for a lot of us, last week I talked to you about how Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you could speak to this mulberry tree and cast it. And I was thinking about that nursery rhyme. Here we go round the mulberry tree, the mulberry tree. Remember that one? Mulberry tree. All the old timers. Here we go round the mulberry tree, right? For a lot of us, conflicts is like that. It, we, we get in this cycle where because we don't know how to resolve it in a healthy way, it, it's like, Rewind. It's like a bad Groundhog's Day. It's like we wake up and we get into the same patterns of conflict, not even with the same people oftentimes, with other people. And it's time to break that pattern. If we're going to do it, we need to fight for peace. Look at what Romans 12, 18, I'm going to go back to that verse. Check this out. This is where it all begins right here. This is your first step. I love that God uses Paul to tell us this morning, if it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, he doesn't just say live at peace with everyone. He actually gives us two caveats here in this verse. Number one, if it is possible. Why does he say that? Because there are some crazy people that just like to fight, that they are so unhealthy themselves that there is no way to make peace with them. You ever meet anybody like that? If they're with you, don't look at them right now. Just look straight ahead. Look at me. You, I got you. We're in this together. 
if it is possible, because it's not possible with everybody. Some people are just impossible to make peace with. I think they actually like fighting. And, they, and, and, and the reality is it's really sad because they're so hurt and wounded and unhealthy in their soul that they don't know how to do it. And that's why it's important that we walk this out and we model it as the church for people, that we get this right. The second thing is, as far as it depends on who? You. On you. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, as far as it depends on you. <laughs> and that's you, that's me, as it depends on you. So where does this begin? It begins with me. It, be it depends on me. It depends on me taking the initiative. So in other words, don't wait for somebody to come to you. If you recognize that there's a conflict, you want to write that down. I want to tell you, you're going to need to take notes because you're going to need to be reminded of this. And some of you, you may be in a small conflict right now, but you're going to, trust me, there'll be a time where you're going to want to go, oh, what, what was that message series on conflict? Let me go back and see, what did I write in there? I put everything on my phone, in my notes, organized so that I can refer back to it because I know that God will use it in a season. And maybe you're not in a season where you have a lot of conflict in your life, but I can tell you there will be a season where you'll need it and you'll need to go back to it. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So there are three things that you're going to need to make peace with or people that you're going to need to make peace with if you're going to, if you're going to fight for peace. And you're going to have to fight through some things. The first one is peace with God. you got to get peace with God. So how this process starts is you recognize that I'm the one who, by Scripture, has been commanded to take initiative. It depends on me. This conflict getting uh, resoluted is dependent upon me taking the initiative. And what begins that process is recognizing that, number one. The second thing is, is we go before God, just like David, and said, search me, O Lord. It's not writing down a list of all the things that the, the person did wrong to you. That's not how this process starts. It's actually going to God. See, and this is where a lot of us get in trouble right off the bat. Because we're hurt. We don't know what to do with that pain. We don't know what to do with the words that were spoken. So to justify our position, see, we're already positioning ourselves to attack. So to justify our position, we start telling people around us. And sometimes in the church, in the namesake of, brother, would you just pray with me about this challenge in my life? Let me tell you, some of those prayer requests are not prayer requests. They are straight up gossip. And they are from, not God, they are from the pit of hell. We need to be careful what we are sharing with other people and not letting our own hurt vent to other people about other people. The first place you make peace with is you make peace with God. It's between you and him. So the first thing you do is you go before God and you pray and you ask him, God, search me. Is there anything in this conflict that I did? What's my sin in this conflict? Take ownership. You need to own your stuff before you confront the other person for them to be able to take ownership of theirs. And you can't even do that on your own. You need the help of the Spirit of God. Because I can tell you this, some of us have bald spots, but all of us have blind spots. And so every one of us, we have blind spots in our lives that we don't see. And we need God to put his finger on those things and say, you know, I love David. I love the Psalms. You read the Psalms. David constantly vents to God about the challenges in his life, the people that have offended him, the offenses that he's pick, picked up. We need to get to a point where God is, our, is, is enough of our best friend that he's the first person we run to when we have a conflict. And he's the first person that we vent to. And he's the first prayer that we pray, God, search me and pour down any way at me. You know, sometimes I think we're just too dang sensitive. Like for some of us, we just need to get over ourselves. Like, come on, I'm sorry. You know, that person didn't say hi to you at church and you got all bent out of shape about it. But do you know what's going on in their world, in their week? I'm sure they didn't mean it, bro. But like, chill out. It's going to be okay. Come on, let it go, let it go, let it go. Come on, sing that with me. No. <laughs> some things, listen, because here's the deal. Some of the conflicts in our life are really offenses that we can overlook. In fact, there's a scripture that says, blessed is the person who can overlook an offense of a brother. Right? 
Maybe it's just something that you could work out with God and you don't even need to go any further with it. I think probably around 25% to maybe 30% of the offenses that we deal with could fall into that category where we could just deal with it, me and God. And then the first question after you say, God, search me and, and point out any wicked way of me, the second question to God is, God, is this something that I should take to them or is this something that I just need to deal with, with you, me and you? We can work it out and I can get peace with you. So that's the first step. Number two, peace with others. Peace with others. That's the goal here. And let me tell you something. You're not going to find peace with other people without fighting for that peace. You're going to have to fight for it, man. Like this is a spiritual battle. It doesn't come easy. It is awkward. Let's just get it out there. It's awkward. It, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's full of anxiety and fear and all that stuff. And you got to be willing enough to fight through those things and fight for the right things. Don't fight to win the, the, the argument or the war or try to persuade somebody or control somebody or demand something of somebody. Fight for peace. Become a peacemaker. Not a peace faker and not a peace breaker. Become a peacemaker because that ultimately is what is going to usher in peace with other people. Amen. The third thing is peace with yourself. Man, you ever wonder why we are a society riddled by anxiety on antidepressants, on anxiety medication? I wonder, I wonder if, when we, if we really could see into our soul the way God does. How much, even, even the physical problems, do you know that I personally believe that there are some connections spiritually to the even physical symptoms and manifestations of sickness and disease in our life that is caused from years of tension, of unresolved conflict and tension and anxiety and stress? I mean, you can go to the medical community and they can tell you that. So more and more science is proving, and the medical community is even proving what the Bible talks about this, that you would be in good health even as your soul prospers, as you get rid of this conflict in your life and you get peace within yourself because you made peace with God and you made peace with other people. And now you can be free. Listen, as much as it depends on you. So in this process, guess what? It doesn't all depend on you. All that depends on you is that you do what God tells you to do in the process. And you trust him enough to leave, leave what happens, leave, leave how the other person responds up to them. That you trust him. God, I'm trusting you that you're going to work this out. That's part of peace with God. Is God, I'm giving this to you. Even though I've, I've got a lot of anxiety, I don't know how it's going to work out. I'm just trusting you. And number, number two, part of peace with God is that I'm obeying God. Because his word commands me to do this. It's not an option in God's kingdom. And somehow we treat it like this is an optional thing. Like if I feel like doing it or if I really value this person enough because I value their friendship enough, then I'll do it. But if I don't, eh. So what? I'll just move on. So if we're going to do this, if we are going to fight for peace, you got to be able to face yourself. you got to face yourself. you got to face these fears. Because really what we're, what we're fearing is we're fear, fearing being vulnerable. We're fear, fearing being exposed. If you look at what Adam in the garden, his reaction when there was conflict for the first time between him and God, what does he do? He runs and hides because he realized I'm naked. And he was afraid. And he was afraid to have a face-to-face, -face, if you will, with God. And so he hid himself. He ran. And then he got defensive, and he blamed his wife. This woman you put you here with, it's her fault. She's the one who showed me the apple. Look good. But you got to face yourself. Colossians 3.8 says this. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. I'm wondering... If we really got real with ourselves and faced the way that we handle conflict, how do you handle it today? Is your first reaction that you get angry? Do you th trash your house? Do you throw things around? Malice? In other words, do you start thinking about ways that you can get back at that person, that you can do something, repay them, evil? Slander? 
Do you start to slander them to your friends and people? Do you start to talk bad about them? Let me tell you what they did to me. And now you are, you are slandering their reputation and using filthy language from your lips. Rid yourself of all this stuff. There is no way that you can even begin the process of resolving conflict until we face ourselves. We face these things and we, we allow the spirit of God to get rid of these things. Wash us clean of all of them. Come before him and say, God, I've got all these emotions inside. I'm angry. It's okay to feel the emotion of ang anger. What it was dependent on you is how you react to the emotion of anger. And you see, uh, we tell our kids this all the time. We blame other people for our own emotions. And in doing so, we say that we are powerless people, that you control me and external things control me. I don't control me. Because, you ever say that to somebody? You make me so mad. You ever say that? You make me so mad. Every time our kids say it, I say, no, nobody can make you mad. You have to choose to be mad because God made you to, with the power to choose and he made you to be a powerful person. Therefore, you need to own your emotions and, and not let other people control you and how you react. Amen. Only I can choose that. I have the power to choose that. God gives me the power to choose that. Now, the, the problem is we don't have enough power to do it. But I love what he says, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. In other words, this is going to take courage. And this is what I want to pray at the end of the service here in just a little bit. Because this is going to take real courage from you to face some of these things and to resolve the conflicts in your life. But he says, God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and what? A sound mind. Some translations say self-discipline. In other words, he's given you the power through his love to control yourself. And he's given you also the courage to face these things in your life. And here's why we need to do it. Because God's reputation is dependent upon it. So the second thing is glorify God. The way that we handle these things in our life is either going to bring glory to God, God, or guess what? It's going to tarnish his reputation. Because as we are calling ourselves Christians, which means little Christ or Christ followers, we are representing Christ. Look what Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord, Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We're representing God, you guys. And, and everything that we do and we say is representing him to the world, and the world is watching. Do you want to you know one of the best witnesses that you can, you can be to the world? Is watch them watch you how you handle conflict and adversity in your life. Anybody can handle good times, just like the Bible says. It's easy to love somebody who loves you. But you want to know the real test of love, to know whether you really have the love of God inside of you and you can walk and live in that, is, is the challenge of will you love somebody when they hurt you? When you have conflict with them. When the world sees that, when the world, just like when the world saw Jesus being spit on and beaten and bruised, and yet... He said with some of his last words on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If we would get a different perspective, and this goes to the next one, honor people. The way we honor people is we recognize that when we get our focus off us, and we get our focus off attacking other people, and we look to be peacemakers, if we're going to be a peacemaker, peacemaker is all about not me thinking about just my needs, and not just thinking about attacking you, but when I start talk, thinking about us. How do we grow closer together? How do we resolve this together where we both walk away feeling good about it and at peace in our life? The only way that's going to happen is if you honor people. Honoring people looks like this. It's recognizing that every single person was created in the image and likeness of God. And like it or not, sin has distorted that very image in them. And the reality is, is we don't see people the way God sees people. Honoring people for who they are means seeing them the way that God sees them, not the way I see them. 
Anybody can see the mess in people's lives. Anybody can point out all the things wrong with you that you need to fix and, and the way that you handled that situation and, and how you did it. And I could, I could point out all the ways that you're wrong. But it takes somebody by the Spirit of God to honor people to see that even though they were reacting this way and acting this way and have said those things, that's not who they really are. That's not how God created them. And, and you peel away all those external things and if you could see them on the inside, you could begin to see the greatness that is inside them because God planted it there. There is good inside of them. And when we take that posture that I'm going to honor you by not just looking at what you said or what you did to me, but the reality that is I'm going to try to see you through the eyes of God. And I'm going to see the potential in you. And in this conflict, one of my goals is that I'm going to honor that potential that is in you, and I'm going to try to draw it out of you. And I'm going to try to remind you and bring back to the surface so that you can see that this isn't you. This isn't who you are. You don't need to be this way. You don't need to act this way. You're better than that. And when that's the goal, to honor people in that way, it's amazing to see how they start to remind themselves, you're right. This isn't who I am. But it takes us being willing to not just look at our own hurt and our pain, but look from a different perspective. Because we don't understand. Listen, you guys. You don't know. Just this last week was such a great reminder to me that what you see on the outside is not the full story. There's so much more going on in the inside. Everybody's got a story. And you don't know what somebody else has walked through in life. You don't know what, what they've gone through in life. It was amazing to me as I got to share my story to hundreds of, of teenagers, the reaction. I had no idea that that was your life. You have no idea what I've been through. And you have no idea what those people have been through that have hurt you, that have wounded you. But if we're gonna... We're gonna glorify God. Part of glorifying God is honoring who God made them to be. Romans 12, 10, just be devoted to one another in love. Listen, this takes commitment. This isn't something that, oh, well, I tried that, it didn't work. No, maybe you didn't try it in the right way. Maybe you weren't devoted enough. This is a commitment to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. And when we do that, it's the last point. We're going to grow stronger in love. We're going to grow stronger in love. Because going through this process, it forces you. Listen, I, I don't and you don't have enough love inside of you to do everything that I just described. I don't have it. And what I love about that is it forces me to be completely dependent on God. I can't love the way you love God. I can't see people the way you see them. I can't make, I can't make peace with people the, the way that you, you lined out in the Bible. I can't do it. I don't know how to do that. I, I've learned the wrong way. I get angry. I say the wrong things. I run. I, don't, I avoid it because I, don't, I, I can't deal with the pain and I don't know how. And God says, if you'll just come to me, just come to me. Let me give you the words to say. Let me give you the strength and the courage to face your fears. Let me give you the power to do this in love. And as we do it, it's amazing. If we're committed to this, you watch step by step. You grow stronger in love. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says this, and may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow. And what? Not just grow, but overflow. Just as our love for you overflows. It's the Lord that makes our love grow. If we're committed to resolving conflict the way that he has for us, we will grow in love for him and we will grow in love for each other. Now here's what I want us to do as we're closing the service. There's some of you in this room and as you've been praying and seeking God already on this, that God is beginning highlighting people 
circumstances in your life where you've been hurt, you've been wounded. Maybe you've been running from those conflicts in your life. There's some of you in the room that you went the opposite way. You went on attack mode. You said some things that you wish you could take back, but you can't now. But you can begin a process of making it right, resolving the conflict. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would fill you with his power, his love, that will give you the self-discipline to be able to begin this process because even next week we're going to take another step and we're going to get into more details of things like how you set up a meeting with somebody and where you begin, how do you, how do you begin talking to that other person and what does forgiveness really look like anyway? I think we need to really learn the art of an apology God's way sometimes we could passively, aggressively say, I'm sorry. And we don't really mean it. We just say it because we know we're supposed to say it. So we don't. Some of us, we just need to let go of some of these offenses that we've picked up that are tripping you up for no reason. It reminds me of a story. You know, sometimes I think we just need to laugh some things off. I remember a story about a conflict between uh, a German chancellor, uh, Otto von Bismarck was his name in the, in the late 16th century. And he had this beef with this professor. And this professor was, was studying trigonosis and how trigonosis happens in meat. And I don't know what happened between the two of them, but there was a pretty big beef between the two of them. And so, um, Otto von Bismarck challenged, back in the day, what they do is they challenge him to, to a, a fight, a war. They mark off the paces, you know, and whoever the, the one that was challenged got to pick the weapons they used in the fight. And so as they gathered for the fight and were taking off their jackets, and usually somebody ends up dying in these conflicts, Otto von Bismarck said to him, choose, choose your weapon. And, and this guy, uh, this, this professor, I was studying trigonosis. He said, and he pointed over there, he says, those are my weapons I choose. And he pointed to two sausages. And he said, one of them is infected with trigono trigoni and the other is clean. May us breakfast together and the loser will keel over with trigonosis. And it amused the chancellor so much that he just called off the whole fight because he realized that this is just stupid. As they laughed about it, they parted their ways and the conflict was resolved. I think sometimes we just need to let things go. Just laugh it off. It's really not that big a deal. And only God can let you know that. For some of you, it is a big deal and it needs to be taken care of. And God can help you in that process. And maybe some of you are here today and you've had this tension. You need peace in your life. The kind of peace that only God can bring. And you've, yet you've never surrendered your life to Him. Today, God can come into your life. If you'll be willing to surrender to Him and stop fighting God. Some of you, you fought God. You're fighting against God. One time God told Paul, stop kicking against the goads. In other words, the reason your life isn't working for you is because you've been resisting me. You're fighting against me and my spirit, trying to draw you to me. And if you would just surrender your life and give up, Say, God, I'm a sinner. Would you come into my life and forgive me? I want to live my life for you. God can change your life today in a moment. He can be changed forever, just like he did for me over 30 years ago. So at the end of service, we're going to have our prayer team up here. And I want you, if that's you, don't leave here today without coming and praying with somebody. For the rest of you, I just want to pray for you right now. Would you stand to your feet? time in our service where we respond to the Word of God. And I believe that some of you, you've been challenged by some of the things the Holy Spirit spoke to your soul this morning. And I want to pray for you, but I also recognize that some of you, you, you have this inner tension. You're fighting with some of these things, and, and you need to surrender them also. 
Some of you need to make a decision to forgive other people and to let go of some offenses. Some of you just need to be empowered by the Spirit of God to begin this process of handling these conflicts in your life in a healthy way. So I want you to just lift your hands to heaven right now. And I want to pray for you. And then part of our response is that we're going to worship to this last worship song. We're going to have our prayer team up here. And I want to invite you to come to the altar. Don't stay in your seat. Sometimes physical obedience brings spiritual breakthrough. And just the fact that you are saying, God, I'm so serious about I need these things resolved in me that I'm willing to just come forward and I'm willing to put them at your feet. As, as we began the service this morning, I said, God, what do you want to do today? And he said, I just want my people to sit at my feet and worship me. And I'm wondering how many of you are here, you just need to sit at the feet of Jesus as we close the service today. So Father, thank you for your presence here with us. God, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring freedom to people that are bound by conflict, by fear, by anxiety, by stress, over the things that they've been hurt and wounded by, the people that they've been wounded by. In fact, right now, I believe the Holy Spirit is bringing a picture of the face of some of those people that have hurt you and wounded you. And right now, he's asking you, are you willing to forgive them the way that I forgave you? Are you willing to let go of those things that you've been holding on to and give them to me? Come on, as we sing this last worship song right now, I just want to encourage you, just sing it out and begin to give them to God as you're singing. God say, I don't want this anymore. I give it to you, God. You're worthy, Father. I want to build my life on your love, not my offense. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Yo